give a uh, give a talk. So uh, Tandy is a founder professor of engineering and computer science at the UIC, and uh, he's also affiliated with uh, quite a few departments like uh, computer engineering, and mathematics, and also animal biology. So Tandy received a PhD in mathematics uh, from the University of California in at Berkeley. And uh, did postdoc with uh, uh, Michael, Wall Michael Waterman, who is a uh, founding father uh, of the field of communication biology. Uh, Tandy uh, was a faculty before at uh, like, uh, University of Pennsylvania and also the University of Texas, Austin. And he just recently just moved to the Dragon uh, Studio campus. Uh, so, well, Teddy also received quite a few uh, uh, awards, like the National Science Foundation Young Investigator Award, and uh, recently the uh, John Simon uh, Gangheim Foundation Fellowship. And Teddy has served uh, quite a few positions in addition to academia. Like Teddy has served as an answer program director in charge of big data, and also the annual HP EDMS uh, review panel. Uh, so, Tandy has done quite a few of, uh, done a large amount of work in computer, computer biology. Uh, he's a, she's a leader in uh, large scale multiple system alignment and uh, financial trade uh, construction. So his her work in uh, system alignment and also financial trade has a very big impact. So yeah, let's welcome. Uh, she talks about her work in system alignment. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I, I want to encourage people to interrupt with questions because I'm going to be covering a range of things and I'm very happy if you have questions and you just ask. Okay, so a lot of what I work on is phylogenomics, which is basically genome scale phylogeny estimation. So this is a species tree on four different organisms. It's one of the most interesting questions from a computational and a statistical framework. I also work on metagenomics, which is in some ways very similar, but now what you have is a collection of data from some environment, and you don't even know what you're looking at. You don't know where the DNA sequences come from, what species, what genes, or anything, and you're trying to make sense of what's in your environment. Uh, a third problem that I work on is multiple sequence alignment. Now, multiple sequence alignment turns out to be central to everything that I'm talking about today. So I'm going to end up telling you about methods for multiple sequence alignment because they're used for phylogeny estimation and the methods are directly or indirectly relevant to metagenomic analysis. So multiple sequence alignment is essentially you have sequences. They could be DNA or amino acids or in fact over any alphabet. And you want to arrange them so that the positions, the columns, all have a common origin. So the context that I work in is uh, evolution. So what you want to do is arrange them so that the positions have a common evolutionary history. So when you only have insertions and deletions and substitutions, you're really just pulling them apart. So stretching them out, inserting spaces. Multiple sequence alignment has applications in many different scientific and biomedical questions. And it has been identified by the National Academies as one of the most important big data problems. There are optimization problems, but all of the optimization problems are NP-hard. There are methods, but none of the methods really do well on complex data sets, and large data sets are particularly hard. So this is a, a really interesting area to work in. Okay, so these three grand challenges, multiple sequence alignment, uh, phylogeny estimation, and the tree of life, and metagenomic taxon identification are all connected via, in fact, multiple sequence alignment. And they're also all connected by evolution. Um, today's talk is going to be about multiple sequence alignment and then using these multiple sequence alignments in different applications. And a unifying technique is going to be something that we developed called an ensemble of hidden markup models. So hidden markup models are very standard techniques in many different uh, computer science problems. And I'm going to be talking about what happens when, instead of using a single hidden markup model, you use a collection of them. OK, so let's just start with the tree of life. Um, the tree of life, you know, how did life evolve? Has many applications to scientific questions, to biomedical questions. 
Uh, small data sets, in other words, a small part of the tree of life is useful for designing drugs and designing flu vaccines, lots of different applications. Uh, phylogenomics is when you're trying to estimate the tree of life using many different parts of the genomes of different organisms. So you're, you're including genome scale data in a phylogenetic perspective. So there's two dimensions. One is the number of genomic regions, which we're just going to call genes. Um, they don't have to really be genes, but they're just genomic regions. So the number of these genomic regions and the other dimension is just the number of species or the number of sequences. Okay. So you can think of a, a matrix can be big in terms of the number of rows or can be big in terms of the number of columns. Two different dimensions. So in the avian phylogenomics project that I worked on for four years, we published finally in 2014, uh, eight papers in science, um, eight, four years of work for eight papers, it was probably worth it. It was a lot of work though. Um, our analysis of 50 bird species, essentially, with 14,000 different genomic regions was enormously computationally intensive, 200 CPU years just for that one data set, okay? And that's on large-scale memory computers, supercomputers around the world. Um, but what we also saw that on those 14,000 different genomic regions is 14,000 different trees. So you have a situation where you have tremendous heterogeneity across the genome. And how do you deal with that heterogeneity? That was one of the challenges. Another project I worked on was for plants. So the same sort of challenges, but different scale of the data set. Here we had about 100 species and less than 1,000 genes. The next study is going to be much larger, but again, we saw very, very, very large heterogeneity across the genomes. Okay, the problem with this data set, which is actually transcriptome data, not genome data, but the problem with this data set for our subsequent analyses, which we're doing now, is that there were sequences, there were genes that we wanted to analyze that are multi-copy, where even though we may only have about a thousand species, we have more than a hundred thousand sequences we want to align. So the question is, how do you deal with making a multiple sequence alignment on more than 100,000 sequences? Okay, so that's, that's the challenge here. So how does one do a phylogeny? Has anyone ever done a phylogeny here? One person, okay. Um, afterwards, go ask her. <laughs> okay, so in a phylogeny, you're trying to answer how did life evolve for some particular set of organisms. You have to decide which organisms you're interested in, which parts of the genome you want to look at, which genes. So these are the taxon set and the markers. You have to go gather the data. That can sometimes be a lot of work. After you have the data for each marker, you need to get sequence alignments. Then you take these multiple sequence alignments, and you're going to get trees on each of these markers. So now you have gene trees, they're called gene trees, on different parts of the genome. And now you want to get a species tree. And so there's two ways. You can either combine all of these alignments into one big multiple sequence alignment, or you can try to get trees on the sequence alignments and combine the trees. Two different approaches. And then now you have a tree on the full set of species, and you're going to look at statistical support, and you're going to estimate dates, and you're going to try to answer biology, right? The point here is that combining the gene trees can be hard because the gene trees can be different. And there's statistical reasons that they can be different, and there's also biological reasons. So biological reasons include gene duplication and loss, and they include horizontal gene transfer, and they also include something called incomplete lineage sorting. All of these things require taking the biological, biological cause for incongruence into account in your statistical way of combining gene trees. But the other thing is look at the multiple sequence alignment. The multiple sequence alignment comes early in this process. If you make errors in the multiple sequence alignment, everything else is wrong. So it, because it comes early, if you get bad multiple sequence alignments, you get bad gene trees. If you get bad gene trees, you're going to get bad species trees. So you need to make that step correctly. You need to do as good a job as you can on the multiple sequence alignment because it has consequences all the way down to even the biological discoveries you're going to make. 
So this is why it's such a central problem. It's an early step in many bioinformatics pipelines. Okay, so now I'm gonna to switch to talking about sequence alignment, but I'm gonna start with a toy cartoon of sequence evolution. So in this model of sequence evolution, what you wanna think of is that you're looking at the piece of a genome inside many different organisms, and these organisms are at the leaves. Okay, you remember human, chimp, gorilla, orangutan? The organisms are at the leaves, but you're looking at a piece of the genome in each of their genome. A piece of the genome for each of the species. And you're tracing the evolution from a common ancestor. So this would be the common ancestor of all of your organisms for that part of the genome. And you're looking at how that sequence at the root evolves within the species tree. What you will notice is that the sequence length here is not changing. And so that is modeling an evolutionary process where only the only thing that's happening are substitutions. So the nucleotides are changing into other nucleotides. By the way, for the people who don't know anything about biology, these are DNA strings, which just means that they are strings over ACTG, and you don't have to think about biology beyond that, okay? Just strings evolving into other strings. And in this model, the only thing that's happening are substitutions. But that's not the only thing that happens. So insertions and deletions happen. And when you have this sequence up here evolving into this sequence, this purple stuff got deleted, this red T changed into a blue C. So this is a model of evolution that allows for the sequence length to change via insertions and deletions, jointly called indels. When you have, when you know the evolution between two sequences, you can represent it in a pairwise alignment. The pairwise alignment says that the two nucleotides have a common history. So the purple stuff got deleted, so the purple stuff over here is above dashes. It means there's nothing in the second sequence that it actually corresponds to. On the other hand, this red T resulted in the blue C, so you have this position here. And here we inserted a red T so it's below a dash, okay? The dashes are there to represent that there's nothing in that sequence that it's truly homologous to. Homologous means common history, common evolutionary history. Okay, so pairwise alignment is defined in this way by the evolutionary history. Now, if you have a tree and you have the sequences at every node and you know how every sequence evolves into every other sequence on the edge, then you have the true pairwise alignment on every edge. And if you have true pairwise alignments on every edge, by transitivity, you can get a multiple sequence alignment. So mathematically, the multiple sequence alignment is defined by the evolutionary history. Now, this is a mathematical statement, but we don't know the true history. So when we're trying to get a good idea of the evolutionary history, and by representing it as a multiple sequence alignment, we don't know if we're right or wrong. Right? We're just trying to do our best guess based upon whatever, how we're, we're modeling evolution. Okay, so how does one get a phylogeny? You have unaligned sequences. You get an alignment using some software. Then you take that alignment and you construct a tree. I just want to point out this tree is unrooted. And evolution, of course, has a root. And there's an, a rooted tree that represents the model of evolution. The reason it's unrooted is mathematical. You cannot infer the location of the root under the models of evolution that people use. The models of evolution are time reversible. So every location for the root is equally good. In practice, what you will do is include an outgroup. You will include some sequence from some species that is closely related enough to be able to detect homology, but not so close that you're not sure it's an outgroup. Okay. Okay. So we're gonna have yes. So when you're constructing this tree, is there a constraint on that each edge is only supposed to correspond to one operation? No. The good question. So the question is, uh, is there any constraint on this on the edges on the meaning of the edges? And and no. These trees you'll notice never have nodes of degree two, right? They never have a node which has one edge coming in and one edge going out. So that these edges can be extremely long distances or multiple or very short distances in, ter in terms of time. But then you could construct another tree in which all the nodes are directly connected to each other, and 
the edge basically corresponds to all the changes between them. There are all the changes between them. It's just it's just think of evolution. So if this were human, chimp, cow, and horse, right? It doesn't matter how long the time is. The true tree looks like that. It's just because human and chimp are more closely related to they are to each other than they are to cow or horse. Yeah, but why would you put? Why would you just directly connect human and cow? Like, what's the rating, relative rating of different trees? Like, I don't know what you mean by that. How did human, chimp, cow, and horse evolve? And maybe I'm not understanding the question, yes? Maybe that's a related question. The vertex, which it doesn't have a label, is it some sort of unknown species? Yes, okay, the vertices represent ancestral species, and you don't know what they are. I haven't talked about that yet. Just think of these as two black boxes. Okay? So think of these as two black boxes that take you from unaligned sequences to sequence alignments, and then from a sequence alignment to a tree. So there's a two step process, and you can make different ways of doing both steps. Okay? But since we're speaking about black boxes, I'll get around to talking about what could be in those black boxes. So in a simulation study, because you don't know the true history. This is one of the problems with evolution. You can't go back in time and say what actually happened. So the way you can study methods, so the things that are filling those black boxes, is to do a simulation, preferably under a realistic model of evolution. And so in your simulation, because you are doing the simulation, you know the true evolution, and you know the true tree, because you define the tree. So the tree will, unrooted tree will be something like that. The true multiple sequence alignment will be something like that. And then you take these sequences and you compress them back down by getting rid of the dashes. And then you re-estimate the alignment. And the estimated alignment is almost certainly not going to be the same thing as the original true alignment. And then on that alignment, you estimate a tree. And again, there's many ways to do both steps. Now you have an estimated alignment, an estimated tree, and you can compare it to the true tree and the true alignment. OK, so this is the standard way for evaluating methods because you don't know the truth. And then you can compare and quantify error. So quantification of error for trees is based upon the bipartitions you get from the edges. So this tree, again, it's rooted, has a bipartition for this edge, which separates S1 and S2 from S3, 4, and 5, right? And the estimated tree over here has the same bipartition. So when they have the same bipartition, that's good. That's a true positive. Now, this edge over here separates S4 and S5 from S1, 2, 3, right, right here. And there's no edge here with that bipartition. So this is an edge you failed to recover. On the other hand, this edge here is a false positive. So there's false negatives, and there's false positives, and there's true positives. And typically, both trees are going to be binary, and so the same number of false negatives and false positives. And we're going to be talking about the fraction of the tree that you failed to recover is the ratio Right? And you'd like that ratio to be zero. You want to have perfect reconstruction. Um, but in this case, there's two internal edges, and one of them is wrong. Okay, So it's a 50% error rate. So that's the error rate. Now, here is a simulation that we did where we ran maximum likelihood to get trees. So in terms of black boxes, we're using code for an NP-hard optimization problem called maximum likelihood under a statistical model of evolution that in fact doesn't have any indels, so you have to treat the indels as missing data. But this is a standard way that people have of constructing trees, is maximum likelihood under statistical models of evolution. So that's the tree estimation part. But what we're actually doing is many different ways of constructing alignments. This was published in 2009, and there are 15 different model conditions, and they range from left to right in terms of difficulty. Now, it's not a perfect arrangement from left to right in terms of difficulty, but every model condition has a 1,000 sequences at the leaves of the tree. And so we are evolving sequences down model trees with a 1,000 sequences, a 1,000 leaves, and they evolve with different rates of evolution and different gap length distributions. So some of them have short gaps, some of them have long gaps. And the top is the tree error, and the bottom is the alignment error. 
So alignment error is similar to tree error. It's, a, it's an average here of the false positives and false negative homologies. Okay? So we want low error for both. What I want you to notice is what are we measuring? We're measuring Raxanel, which is maximum likelihood for software, on five different alignments, including the true alignment. So the true alignment is in black. Okay? Everything else is estimated. The estimation methods are Clustal W, which is a very popular method for a long time, and this is DNA sequence evolution. Okay? Clustal, muscle, mat, prank given a good guy tree, and then the true alignment. Now, the first six models, the tree error is low. Oh, this isn't working. The first six models, the tree error is low, right? And then it expands. Which method has the worst tree error? Anyone? It's this one, right? Clustal. Clustal, which everyone uses, okay? This is a wake-up call because people use Clustal and they assume it's good, and it's really, it's not good on DNA sequences with high rates of evolution, okay? It's, it's actually a different story when you get to proteins, and it's a different story when you get to low rates of evolution, but it's not good for DNA with high rates of evolution. The other methods, it's not like anything is particularly good. Okay? There are cases where they're good, the cases where they're bad. What about alignment error? Cholesterol has the highest alignment error. Okay, but what can we learn from this? Even on a thousand sequences, you can get good alignments and you can get good trees if the rate of evolution is low enough. So rate of evolution is really a problem. If it's a low rate of evolution, big data sets are not a problem in terms of alignments. If it's a low rate of evolution, you can get a good tree. But if it's a high rate of evolution, you're going to get a bad alignment, you're going to get a bad tree. Okay, so large scale alignment estimation, if you have a high rate of evolution, you're just not going to be able to get a good alignment using standard methods, and many biologists are going to throw out those data because they can't align them. In fact, they're called unalignable. So you're throwing out a lot of your data, which is <coughs> impacting your ability to answer biological questions. So we have a problem here and that we're trying to address. So again, the observation that with a low amount of evolutionary rate, though it's not too much heterogeneity in your data set, you can get a good alignment, it suggests a divide and conquer strategy. So imagine that you have a very large data set and it's very heterogeneous <coughs> and you would like to get a good alignment on it. And you already know that you can get a good alignment if it's a low enough rate of evolution, even if it's a big data set. So take your data set and try to divide into subsets so that you're actually more on this end of the scale, right? How do you do that? You can get an initial tree. Estimate an alignment and get an initial tree. And even if that tree is not so great, hopefully it's not terrible. And then use that initial tree to break your data set into subsets so that each subset has low heterogeneity. Then on each of those subsets, Use your preferred alignment method, whatever it is, and align the sequences in each subset. And now you have, in this case, a picture here of four subsets. You have four multiple sequence alignments on disjoint sets. And then you merge them pairwise until you get an alignment on everything. Okay? Now you have a new alignment and you get a new tree. And your new tree, you can either stop or you could repeat the process and iterate. So, SATA was developed in 2009, it was improved in 2012, and the most recent version is called PASTA, and it has this kind of iterative divide and conquer strategy. And here's what SATA looked like, the first SATA from 2009. A 24-hour analysis, bright red, gives much better trees. I'm not showing the alignment error, but the similar story. So we were happy, you know, but there's still this gap, right? There's this big gap here. And so we wanted to get a better alignment. Reduce the alignment error, therefore reduce the tree error. What we realized is that SETE was making a certain decomposition into sets that were, some of the sets were too big. And we couldn't use, we were running mapped, by the way, mapped on subsets. So mapped on subsets of size, hopefully 200. But actually what we were getting is subsets of, that could be much larger. And mapped actually degrades when you get above 200. 
So we redesigned the divide and conquer strategy so that it made small subsets consistently and now dashed purple, much better alignments and much better trees. This method could go to 50,000 sequences. The original one could only go to about 8,000 sequences. Now, 50,000 sequences is almost good enough for the 1KP, the 1,000 plant transcriptome data. Almost. Not quite, because we had 100,000 sequences there. So we said, what the problem is here is that we're aligning alignments together, and the last pairwise merge is really computationally intensive. So we came up with this nice way of doing merging alignments together so we never had to do these large pairwise alignments. And that's pasta. And pasta, surprisingly, is not only faster, but it's more accurate. Pasta can go to a million sequences. And this is showing the tree art on a million sequences on the actually pretty complex, um, it's showing tree art up to 200,000, and then, and then in, in text up to a million. This is a simulation um, model which is not IID. The, there's actually long range dependencies that are based upon RNA sequence uh, you know, structure evolution. And what we're seeing is that pasta is in purple, black is what you get on the true alignment. Um, and here's sate all the way back over here, much higher error than pasta. And then sate can't even run in 24 hours on 50,000. And the only things that are running in 24 hours on 50, uh, large data sets are our own starting tree that we computed and then pasta and what we get on the reference one. So much, much, much better accuracy. And even on a million sequences, only 6% error. I want to point out that the sequence length is 1,500 nucleotides. 1,500 nucleotides sufficing for a million sequences, getting only 6% tree error. So pasta is great. Um, these are again meta methods that are doing divide and conquer. You can substitute any alignment method you like on the subsets, and we've been exploring what happens when you use much more computationally intensive but statistically sophisticated methods. Okay, so now we think we can analyze the plant transcriptome data, right? 100,000 sequences, that's nothing, right? A million, we can do a million, so of course we can do 100,000. So we got really bad alignments. And we looked at other methods, they all gave bad alignments, and so we looked at the sequence length histogram, and it's crazy. Um, full length is over here. Look at all of these fragments. Now these are transcriptome data, which is probably the problem. But the sequence length heterogeneity here, there's some extremely long sequences, and there's some very short sequences. These are amino acid sequences, it's bizarre. And nothing was working well here. And this was a thing that we had not thought about. Sequence length heterogeneity. Probably any of you who have worked with transcriptome data have seen this kind of thing, but methods are not designed for this. So all the standard methods were terrible. So we realized that the challenge that we're facing is not just a large data set, not just fast evolving data sets, but sequence length heterogeneity. Okay. So we came up with this new method up, which was just published. Um, well, no longer just published, published just a little bit more than a year ago. Um, and the objective was to do large scale, multiple sequence alignment, even when you have lots of fragments. Okay, so how would you do this? I mean, there's sort of an obvious thing to do. Figure out what you think full length is and throw out everything else, right? And align what you have that's full length and then try to add in the fragments, right? Because that's kind of an obvious thing to do. Because we know we can do good alignments on full length sequences, let's just do that and then add everything back in. Okay, how would you add things into an alignment? How would you add fragments into an alignment when on the full length sequences? There's some obvious meta, uh, bioinformatics tools, one of which is called the profile of the market model. Okay, so we're going to show what we did. It's almost using a profile hidden market model approach, except that we don't use one HMM, we use many. So here's the simple idea. You take the sequences, you throw out all of the fragments, and from what's left, you build an alignment, right? <coughs> so that alignment is going to be then modeled 
by a hidden markup model. Now, the other thing you could do is you could say, I don't want to have to build an alignment on a really big data set, so I'm going to take a random subset of the full length sequences and proceed. So, both, both approaches. Throw out the fragments from what's left, extract a subset, build a hidden markup, build an alignment on the subset, and then build a profile hidden markup model to represent that alignment. The profile hidden markup model could be used to align everything else. And that's standard techniques in bioinformatics. It works really well when your data set has a low rate of evolution. It works really well when the full set of sequences have low heterogeneity. And it doesn't work so well otherwise. So this was an observation that was very interesting. If you have sequences and you've drawn a tree for the sequences, and the sequence in the tree has a lot of evolutionary distance on it, so that sequences in that tree can be very different from each other, a single profile HMM does not actually represent the heterogeneity very well. And the key observation here is that these profile HMMs, I don't know how many of you have actually worked with profile HMMs? Like, you know, like six people. Okay, well, you don't have a lot of, you don't have experience with this, but let me just tell you that what they're doing is they're taking an alignment and they're taking the positions in the alignment and they're trying to represent each position by a state. And that's fine when there's not a lot of heterogeneity. It's really good at representing what's conserved. It's not very good at representing the changes. In other words, if there's a lot of heterogeneity, it's not very well designed. So if you have a single HMM to represent that entire multiple sequence alignment, it can fail to readily to do a good job. But given that you've got a tree, the same kind of divide and conquer thing should work. So what's the obvious thing? Use the tree to divide into subsets. So maybe two subsets. Now you've reduced the heterogeneity. And you get an HMM for each of the two subsets, right? So you have an original alignment on the full data set. You look at the induced subsets. You look at the induced alignments. And you build HMMs on the two subsets. And now you take your additional sequences and you say, Use the profile HMMs that you have on the two alignments and see which one you score better with. Whichever one you score better with, use that to add yourself to the alignment of the subset and then by transitivity into the full alignment. Two HMMs instead of one. Now, if two is good, four might be better. And if four is good, maybe seven is better. So what do I mean by seven? The original Sequence alignment has an HMM. When you divide into two, each of those gives you HMMs. Then you divide those again, and each of those gives you HMMs. So this, this hierarchy of HMMs is the collection that we use. The reason we're using multiple sizes is it turns out that different sequences sort of do better with different sizes, and we didn't want to have to specify in advance. Do you have a question? Uh, I have just... Uh theoretical question. Your fragmentation may come from the uh, alternative splicing and different uh, exon usage because a gene is a combination of the exons and different isoforms are using them in different combinations. So in this case, if you will do the alignments for the exons, uh, you, you know exactly how many uh, HMMs you need to do and they are following the same evolution. Okay, that's a really interesting question, but I think I, I would like to talk with you about it later. Sure. Because it, it, it sort of, it, it, I'm, I'm intrigued, but let's, let's talk about it a little later. Okay, so, so now what we have is instead of one HMM, we have these multiple set of HMMs. So the up algorithmic approach is exactly this. You take the full length sequences, in other words, you throw out the fragments, take the full length sequences, you take a random subset, which can be quite small, of that set, and you use that, that set to get a multiple sequence alignment, and then from that multiple sequence alignment, you get a tree, and then you use the tree to get this ensemble of HMMs. Now you add all the remaining sequences into the alignment using the ensemble. So the evaluation, we looked at a bunch of, of simulated data sets of different, different simulators and different level of complexity. Um, and we also looked at some biological data sets, including proteins. So this is not just for RNA or DNA. And the two biological collections are have structural alignments. So it's, like I said, it's very hard to know the true evolutionary history, 
But in some cases, you have structural information which you can use to get an alignment. And to the extent that structural alignments are evolutionary, they're the same question. They're not necessarily always the same thing. OK. So here's, I'm going to show you results on the simulated data, but the results in the biological data are similar, and this is all published. So on a million sequences, we are comparing two versions of up with pasta, and this is alignment error. So pasta, again, is taking the data set and breaking into subsets of size 200 on which it runs mapped. Okay? Um, RNA sim here, uh, the million sequences, this is up fast with no decomposition. Fast means that the backbone has only 100 sequences. Okay? No decomposition means we use a single HMM. Blue is fast, but you do the decomposition. So what you can see is that up is slightly, with decomposition is ever so slightly better than with no decomposition, but both of them are substantially better than pasta in terms of alignment error. Now, tree error, it's a little bit different, and it's interesting. Pasta has better trees. And the improvement you get in the tree by doing decomposition is more visible here than the improvement you get in terms of alignment, right? Alignment, you can hardly see a difference here. So green versus blue, you can see a difference here. So the decomposition is actually helping the tree more than it's helping the alignment. But pasta trees are better than up trees. So up alignments are better than pasta trees. Again, it's a question of how you measure error. These are, are very parallelizable algorithms, and they run in just days, okay, on a million sequences. Okay. So far, up and pasta look like they're you know, pretty similar in terms of accuracy. One's better for trees, one's better for alignments. The real difference is in terms of fragmentation. The simulation I just showed you was everything was full length. Here's what you get with fragments. As you increase the fragmentation from no fragmentation to 50% of your sequences being fragmentary, we're looking at the impact on error for pasta versus the default way of running up. And what you can see is that Pasta remains flat. It does not get impacted by fragments, right? Um, whereas pasta gets much higher. Up, up is flat, and pasta error climbs. Now, up is using pasta for the backbone, but the backbone is only on the full length sequences, whereas pasta is using uh, mapped on the subsets and the subsets include fragments. So this is because MAFT is reacting to fragments, okay? But all of the standard methods react to fragments, whereas UP is not doing anything with fragments ex except when it adds things in, it's adding things in using ensembles of HMMs. HMMs are designed to deal with local alignment, and so they can deal with fragmentary sequences. So that's the key. So this is alignment error, and this is tree error, up is robust to fragments, to substantial fragmentation in a way that pasta simply isn't. So running time is linear with the number of sequences, which is nice. Um, so the summary so far, most multiple sequence alignment methods just can't run on big data sets, or if they can run on big data sets, they degrade in accuracy. Both pasta and up are doing divide and conquer to improve the scalability of base methods to large data sets. What that means is you can take new methods and plug them in. And we've been testing that. We've been taking new methods as they're developed, plugging them into pasta, plugging them into up. Um, HMMs are not, by design, really impacted by fragmentation, but single HMMs are impacted by heterogeneity. So ensembles of HMMs are able to be better with highly heterogeneous and fragmentary data sets. OK, so that's, that's multiple sequence alignment. And now what I want to do is switch to applications of multiple sequence alignment. So we just remember that this single HMMs are not as good as multiple HMMs. OK, so metagenomics. Anyone work on metagenomics? Yeah, I want to name one person. OK, so in, in the metagenomics context, I mean, you all have probably heard about the microbiome, the human microbiome. Imagine what you do is you go and you um, take a sample of some uh, water from, from the pond, and now you'd like to know what's in that, that sample. And you run it through some sequencers, and what you get is a lot of short DNA sequences. And you want to look at those DNA sequences and figure out what they are. How do you do that? You don't even know what species they come from. 
So the microbiome is one of the applications, it's not the only application. So you can use this to discover new genes, to discover new species, and you can do clinical stuff with it. So basic questions, what is this DNA sequence? You have, let's say, 50 nucleotides, or maybe 100 nucleotides. What gene is it? What species is it? That's a basic question. Um, given a sample, what is the taxonomic distribution within the sample? So what fraction of the species of the you know, are coming from a particular species versus another one. And then systems biology questions. Now, the systems biology questions depend upon the previous two questions. So I'm going to talk about how we do the previous two questions. Okay, so taxon identification, you'd like to know what species a particular read is, but you may not be able to be sure about the species. You may only be able to say what genus it is, or maybe not even genus. You might have to go up the family level or keep going up. Abundance profiling is saying, Here's the true distribution. You want to estimate the distribution at some taxonomic level. How accurate is your estimate? Um, so TIP was designed to answer the first two questions, and I'm going to show you results in terms of abundance profiling. So it's going to be using this ensemble of HMMs. So it's this three-step process. You have a collection of reads from some shotgun sequencing. The first thing you do is you have a set of what we call marker genes. Now, marker genes are genes that are single copy and omnipresent in life. The reason we're using these marker genes is we're trying to estimate the abundance of each species in your data set. And if you use a gene that appears multiple copy within species, then you really can't do a good job of estimating the abundance because you have to correct for the multiple copy problem. So we're going to use the genes that only appear once, and we're using genes that came from uh, Metafiler, which is developed at the University of Maryland by Mihai Pop. So we're going to take all these reads, and we're going to say, does this particular read map to one of our marker genes? If it does, we include it. If it doesn't, we throw it out and never look at it again. So the very first thing we do is throw out most of our data. Okay? Throw out almost everything, and we're only looking at the things that map to marker genes. Now, for each marker gene, we look at the reads that got mapped to that marker gene, and we do a taxonomic prediction for every sequence in that bin. And then we're combining all of those predictions across all the bins, okay? So the key thing is really just how do we do number two? So how do we do step two? You have a bunch of reads that are all going to the same gene, and you want to taxonomically characterize them. Phylogenetic placement is one of the approaches that you can use, and it's been proposed by others. The idea is you have, again, a, a particular gene. You have a reference alignment that you've computed and a reference tree that you've computed. right? And this could be all the full-length sequences for this gene. So you get a good alignment, you get a good tree, and now you're going to take every remaining sequence and try to add it into the tree. Once you add it into the tree, you can use its placement in the tree to get an idea about what the species is. Now, if it places too high in the tree, you may not know what the species is, you may just know what the genus is, or maybe just the family. You get the idea? Placing it into the tree. How do you place something into a tree? So there's two steps. The first step is take this query sequence and add it into the alignment. Add it into the reference alignment. Once you've added it into the reference alignment, then you can place it in the tree using maximum likelihood. Okay, two steps. The first step is the alignment step. Okay, query sequence, se reference sequences, align, add into the tree. Okay, how do we do the first step of getting the alignment? We're going to actually try the simple approach of a single HMM. This is what was proposed by Alexis Stamatakis several years ago. Single HMM. Build an HMM on the backbone alignment, align every query sequence into the backbone alignment using the profile HMM. Guess what? It doesn't work so well. TIP does the ensemble of HMMs instead, and it works better. So we did a comparison to a bunch of different methods that at the time were the leading methods. And here are the results. So this is a uh, a sort of a simulation, you take biological data, but you make query sequences using uh, different sequencing error models. And this is where you're training on the, on the data that includes the sequences you're trying to classify. But they include 
noise-free versions of the sequences, and what you're actually looking at are fragmentary versions of the sequences that have indels and substitutions. So this is high indel data sets for known genomes. This is the distance between your estimated distribution and the true distribution. So you want it to be low. So lower is better. Of all of these methods, only two methods were able to run under the long sequence high indel model. All the others failed on at least one data set. So the two methods that could run are TIP and FIMBLE. Okay? Everything else was unable to run on at least one data set. And TIP has better error, in other words, lower distance from the true distribution. Now, under short sequences, they could all run. And TIP now is basically the same accuracy as Metaplan. So what we're seeing is that some methods could only run on long sequences, some can only run, well, some methods cannot run on long sequences, and others, all of them are able to run on short sequences. But with high indels, TIP has good performance, and the other methods weren't as good, and the competing one, which you could think of is, um, this one is Metaflan. Metaflan can run on short sequences, and it can't run on long sequences. Now, again, this is where you're training on the data that you're then testing on. What happens if you're looking at something novel and you want to classify something that's not in your databases, which is what most of bacterial life is? The novel genome data sets, we see a similar thing. So the easy means you don't have indels or high indels, so different sequencing technologies. Long versus short, in every case, methods either fail to run or have poor accuracy under some condition. The only methods that having good accuracy across everything is really TIP. So what's going on here? All the other methods are basically looking at KMERS. So KMER distributions, you're basically trying to look at short sequences like, you know, K is 5, K is 20, whatever. These, these statistics you're computing are really impacted by indels. And they're messed up by indels. So this reliance upon KMER distributions is a problem. But almost all the other methods are actually classifying every read in the data set. We're only classifying the ones that map to marker genes. So there's this remarkable robustness. Even though you're throwing out most of your data, you're getting a very good estimate of the distribution. OK, so TIP is highly accurate. It's actually quite fast. It is robust to high indole rates. It can work with many sequencing technologies. And it's, it's uh, we're very happy with it. OK, so summary so far. And then I have one more thing to show you. So sate and pasta are ways of co-estimating alignments in trees. And they give very good alignments and very good trees. But you need full length sequences. By the way, everything here is open source, and you can use it. Um, up is an alignment method that is able to be very robust to fragmentary data. but when you have only full-length sequences, it's very possible that pasta is better. TIP is an application of the ensemble of HMMs to deal with metagenomic sequences. And what I showed you is how well it can do the abundance profiling. OK, there are other applications of the ensemble of HMMs. One that is not yet published is HIPHOP, which is doing remote homology detection for proteins. Here's the results. Um, I'm showing you results and not the method because there's not much time. But this is, we were looking at PFAM data, and we were taking for the PFAM collection of families. For each family, we remove some sequences and we build on the reference alignment uh, an ensemble of HMMs. And we also represented it by a single HMM, and we also uh, compared the, those two methods to HH, Surge, and BLAST. So these are sort of classical methods for detecting homology. So what would we do? We then take a seed sequence that is not in the, the backbone alignments, and we say, of all of the different um, PFAM families, which PFAM family do you belong to? Okay. So there's many thousand. So what you have now is you have many ensembles of HMMs representing the different PFAM families. And this is precision recall. If everything is full length, we have red is uh, hip hop, and the second best is a single HMM. So multiple HMMs is better than a single HMM. And then the third best is blast, and then HH search is worse. If your sequence length is fragmentary, then 
The best is hip hop, the second best is blast. Notice the switch. Then the third best is a single HMM, and then you get down to HH search. So this idea of using multiple HMMs instead of a single HMM is quite flexible. And when you do this, you take the power of profile HMMs, but you make them able to run on diverse data sets. You make them able to run with greater sensitivity, the ability to detect homology that's hard to detect, and with high accuracy. Okay, tree of life, multiple challenges. We focus mostly today on ultra large multiple sequence alignment, but there's many, many, many other things that are really interesting to work on and that have a combination of techniques with high impact. Um, the one that I'm particularly enjoying these days is estimating species trees from many gene trees. Um, but it's a really fun area for any kind of computer scientist. So it's like anyone could work on this. It's fun. Um, the people I want to thank for this, the two people who worked on the multiple sequence alignment stuff. So Nam is the, the first author on UP and TIP. Um, and Siavash is the first author on PASTA. They've also worked on UP and TIP. Siavash is now at UCSD as a faculty member at ECE, just started. And Nam is finishing his postdoc with me. He was my grad student, but he's moving on to UCSD to be a postdoc with Vineet Bhatna. And this work has been supported largely by NSF, um, but also the Guggenheim and uh, absolutely used TAC, which is the Texas Advanced Computing Center, and Blue Waters at Illinois. So this is very compute intensive, high performance computing stuff as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah? Yeah, you, yeah, you talk about the, uh, how do you evaluate the message using single negative data line. So I'm just curious how do you evaluate the, the real data? So for the biological data sets that have reference alignments, we also looked at accuracy with respect to reference alignments. And we see the same trends. Um, at least PASTA gives better uh, alignments and trees on RNA SIM, sorry, on um, Gutel's 16S comparative ribosomal database. Um, and on the large protein data sets, so we've looked at uh, Valibase and other collections for large data sets, not small data sets, we see similar improvements. So when you look at very small data sets, like you know, five sequences at a time, there's no point in using up or pasta, right? Uh, but when you get to 100 and more, it makes a difference. It seems to also make a difference even on smaller data sets. So PASTA was used instead of MAFT on the avian data. PASTA was used instead of MAFT and other things on the 1KP data. And it, it, this was based upon estimates of how reliable the alignments were. But we're using structural alignments to measure on biological data. So for the protein uh, alignment, how big is the protein alignment data set? So the largest ones um, were about 800 sequences. We found a few structurally aligned benchmark data sets with about 800 sequences. They're not very many. I think we found about 10 that were in the range of like 100 to 1,000. But all of them have structures. Just well, the ones that we found, they claimed were structurally aligned. So whether those are accurate alignments or not is a very good question. It, it's, a, it's one of the challenges of doing evaluation because biological data and simulated data are really not the same. And what's accurate on biological data might not be what's accurate on simulated data. So we have to look at both and we have to hope that we're better in both. Fortunately, on the big data sets, we're seeing that kind of improvement. But that's not true for all methods. But it is, fortunately, so far true for pasta. Yeah, so for the, the transcript project, right? so how do you evaluate the results? So we knew that the trees were wrong before we developed up, right? Um, but that's because on the P54 gene, we got really bad trees. So, you know, if you get the alignment and the, you can't refute the alignment, but you get a tree that looks ridiculous, you know there's something wrong. Now, it could just be that maximum likelihood on a matrix that has lots of missing data is just going to be bad. But in fact, 
when we redid the alignment using up, we got trees that made more sense. So we actually think that the, the alignment was the problem. You had a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't, uh, I was, didn't understand you said the marker genes because you need the marker to get up. Yeah, so there are these like housekeeping genes that, that are present in all organisms. And, and some, uh, some genes are only show up in single copy so far. And they are expected to be resistant to horizontal gene transfer. Now, whether or not this is really true is another matter. Um, it could be that they're not single copy. It could be that there that there is horizontal gene transfer going on. But there is so one of the things that people like Mihai Pop are trying to do is figure out which genes really are reliable in that sense. But the next thing you can do is say instead of restricting yourself to marker genes and only classifying stuff that maps to marker genes. Why don't you just deal with all of the genes you can get, classify everything you can, and then figure out a good way to take into account the fact that there's copy number variation across the tree of life. But that's hard, right? An another problem that's really hard in metagenomics is metagenomic assembly. Metagenome assembly. So, you know, in a single, for a single um, organism, when you do genome assembly, you know it's all one organism, so you can do things, you can get context. It's not clear you can safely do that with metagenome data sets. So you're really maybe stuck with very short sequences. But I mean, I'm changing the topic now, but it all connects. Because if you can do context, you can do better classification, right? So all of this connects. Yeah? Yeah, I guess I was wondering uh, how much of the accuracy was, I guess, uh, trying to figure out how much of the it's a it's a really good question. The question is how much of TIPS accuracy is impacted by the choice of marker genes? What if we took a subset of that set? No, not all of the marker genes. What if we took a larger set, right? Um, we're actually exploring this, and it looks like as you add, it helps, but you really do have to be concerned about copy number. Um, Metaflan, which is one of the methods that did quite well, it has its own definition of marker genes, but it's just looking for presence or absence. So within a given clade, you might have, for example, you could use genes that are not omnipresent, but are still multiple, single copy. So there, there are ways in which you can use more data. And expanding the, the amount of data you can use is really important. So a good question. Yeah. Another related question. So, um, just wondering in the real data set, how much heterogeneity do you have? Like, what's the in sequence life? Yeah. Huge. That's okay. That's one of the things that we put in the paper. We looked at, for example, we looked at Gutel's data. So, you know, one of the reasons there's heterogeneity in the transcriptome data is it's transcriptome data. It has that property. But Gutel's comparative ribosomal data sets also show heterogeneity, and those are not transcriptome data. And a, like a lot of published data sets show a lot of heterogeneity. So now, every time someone says that they want to align their data set and they want to have some, get some advice on how to align it, the first question I ask is, what's your sequence like heterogeneity situation? It seems to be a bigger problem, a much more endemic problem than I thought. So any of you who want to align data sets, look at the sequence like heterogeneity before you figure out what alignment method you pick. It's, it's, it turns out to be a problem. Yeah? So it seems that you cause a heterogeneity, so the model you see in multiple sequence alignment is very important, right? So you use the ensemble HMN. Do you see any possibility of applying deep learning methods? In this so, so these conversations I've been having today have been making me think I need to think about deep learning. Um, I think the answer is yeah. I think it's going to be become useful um, for alignment because we have a lot of benchmark data sets that you can learn from. Um, but I think that's really futuristic, so maybe someone wants to do it, that'd be great. Uh, but there are other machine learning models besides profile HMMs. Um, and, and so another direction simply is, without going all the way to deep learning, is just say, take a more sophisticated model for representing alignments and, and see if you can use that instead. And so just to throw it out there, there's a method called Balify, which is a Bayesian co-estimation method of alignments in trees. It has it assumes a statistical model of evolution that is very much like the standard stochastic models in, in phylogenetics, but has indels as well. 
And it has really beautiful performance on simulated data. Um, but the simulated data are simulated under models that look like what it's estimating under. And it doesn't look as good on biological data. So I think there's this other issue, which is just how do we really model the evolutionary process that's happening on, for example, proteins? It's a fundamental question that we don't know how to do. And until we know how to do that, we can't do alignment estimation or tree estimation really rigorously. So both of those things have to be addressed, the model of evolution and then the bioinformatics model for representing alignment. Any last questions? Okay, well, thank you.